I think this question is not just about engineering, but also about your critical thinking and analytical skills. If you use the same bow to shoot arrows at angles of 45 degrees, 0 degrees and 60 degrees, which angle will make the arrow travel the farthest? You have four possible choices. Choice A, 45 degrees. Choice B, 0 degrees. Choice C, 60 degrees. And last but not least, choice D, neither one. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the answer. On my end, I am moving forward to share with you my version of the analysis and answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. Let's start by looking at the scenario where we shoot the arrow at zero degrees, which ultimately means horizontal shot. When you shoot it at zero degrees, it means you're firing it horizontally parallel to the ground. In this case, the arrow initial velocity is responsible for its horizontal distance because there is no vertical component in its motion. What's interesting here is that the arrow will cover some horizontal distance, but it won't travel very far because gravity starts acting on it immediately, pulling it downward. Now let's compare it to shooting an arrow at a 60 degree angle. This means we are launching it at a steeper angle upward compared with even 45 degree angle. What's interesting in this case is that while it still have a horizontal component, more of its initial velocity is directed upward. As a result, the arrow will reach a greater height but cover less horizontal distance before it hits the ground. Which brings us to the 45 degree angle solution. If you want to make sure your arrow reach farthest horizontal distance, you should shoot it at a 45 degree angle. 45 degree angle allows for the best balance between horizontal and vertical components of an arrow's motion, maximizing its range. So the correct answer here is choice B, 45 degrees. Did you get to the same answer? If not, please make sure to share your thoughts and rationale in comments so we can all learn. Here's an amazing question which tests your knowledge of objects, their properties and the way they move from the top of the hill down to the ground. You're presented with three different objects and you need to determine which object will reach ground first when pushed to slide from the top of the hill. You have four possible choices to select from. Choice A, wheel. Choice B, wooden box. Choice C, sticky substance. And last but not least, choice D, they all reach the ground at the same time. Take a close look, maybe pause this video to see if you can come up with the answer. On my end, I have my selection, so I'm moving forward to share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. To determine the answer, let's look at each object individually. This will help us decide all the considerations related to the sliding from the top of the hill down to the ground. Let's start with the cube. Cube's shape may cause it to experience high levels of friction against the slide, slowing its descent. But at the same time, sticky substance may move even slower. Because the behavior of sticky substance will largely depend on its viscosity and adhesive properties. If the substance is highly viscous and adheres strongly to the slide, it may experience significant resistance and it will take much longer for it to reach the ground. In some scenarios, depending upon viscosity, the sticky substance may never reach the ground at all. Based on this, I think most likely sticky substance will be the slowest in reaching down the bottom of the slide, followed by the cube which would be second in the sliding down. So as you might have guessed, I am putting my bets on the wheel. I think wheel's rolling motion will help reduce friction with the slide, allowing wheel to move more smoothly. This is why the wheel may reach the ground faster than all other objects. This is why I think the correct answer is choice A, wheel, because the wheel will roll and will have minimum friction to reach the ground. Did you come to the different conclusion? If yes, please make sure to post your answer, solution and rationale in comments so we can all learn. Here's a very interesting question where you need to demonstrate your knowledge of tools and their uses. Samir is about to tackle a tricky repair job. You need to identify the essential tool featured in the image and select the option that best matches it. You're presented with five choices. Choices A, B, C, D, E. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the answer. On my end, I am moving forward to share with you my version of the solution. 
And obviously, if you have a better way to solve this, as usual, please post in comments. I believe you probably recognize the tool shown. It is screwdriver. But this is only the first step. In the second step, we need to identify all other tools shown and determine their relationship with screwdriver. I think choice A is a knife. A knife is a cutting tool, and it is not closely related to a screwdriver. Choice B is a nail. A nail is a fastening tool, which is used to join materials, but it's also not directly related to the screwdriver. Choice D is a hammer. A hammer is a tool that used to drive nails or other fasteners, which is different from screwdriver's primary function. And choice E is a bolt, which is the type of fastener, like a screw, but it's not directly related to a screwdriver. So, as you might have guessed, the correct answer here is choice C, screw. In fact, screwdriver is specifically designed for turning screws. When using a screwdriver, you insert its tip into the head of a screw and turn it to tighten or loosen the screw. You can even guess it based on the names, screwdriver and screw. This relationship between the screwdriver and the screw makes choice C the most closely related tool or object to the screwdriver in the given options. Was your answer different? Or maybe you had other considerations? If you did, please make sure to post them in comments so we can all learn. I love this question because it tests your spatial reasoning. And if you try to solve it on your own, it boosts your IQ and intelligence. You're presented with unusually looking shape which have some measurements, and you need to calculate the perimeter of the given shape and select it out of four possible choices. Choice A, 6 feet. Choice B, 10 feet. Choice C, 12 feet. And last but not least, choice D, 14 feet. Take a close look to see if you can calculate the answer. I am pretty sure if you are a subscriber to this channel and practice these types of problems regularly, you'll do it easily. On my end, I am moving forward to share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better solution, please make sure to post your answer and solution in comments. As you might be well aware, to calculate the perimeter, you need to add up the length of all the sides. In our object, we are presented with the steps that have measurements. And this object also has a solid sides at the bottom and on the left. So first, let's calculate the perimeter of the steps. The top sides are all 1 feet and the heights of every step is also 1 feet. So the steps would be calculated 1 feet plus 1 feet plus 1 feet plus 1 feet and then you do it 6 times because it has 6 sides which means that the perimeter of all the steps would be 6 feet. The bottom area based on the measurements would be 3 feet and the left area would be 3 feet as well. So the total perimeter would be 6 feet for the steps then 3 for the bottom and we also need to add 3 feet for the left area, which would total to 12 feet. So the correct answer here is choice C, 12 feet. Did you get to the same answer? If not, please make sure to post your solution and rationale in comments. And now I have a question for you to practice your skills. You are presented with the seesaw. On the left of the seesaw there is a weight, and on the right side of the seesaw there is an acrobat. You need to determine in which direction should the acrobat move his body to balance the seesaw. And you have two choices, choice A to the left or choice B to the right. Take a close look, maybe pause this video to see if you can come up with the answer. And once ready, make sure to post your answer in comments so I can give you my feedback. Thanks for participating and good luck solving the challenge. Here's an amazing question to see how well you know the tools. You're presented with five tools and you need to match the tool with the task performed. Choice 1. Tool is used for making curved cuts in various materials. Choice 2. Is used to loosen or tighten plumbing pipes. Choice 3. Used to apply sparkle or correction putty. Choice 4. Is used to apply lubrication to gears and machinery. And last but not least, choice 5. Is used for cutting down trees, trimming branches and processing woods. And you need to match this description with choices A, B, C, D, and E. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the answer. Are you ready? I think I'm ready on my end, so I'm moving forward to share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. Let's start with the choice 1. I believe the description for choice 1 is a jigsaw. Jigsaw 
is a handheld power tool equipped with the reciprocating blade used for making intricate curved cuts in the materials such as wood, metal or plastic. And description 1 matches image B. I think choice 2 matches the pipe wrench. And the pipe wrench is a specialized hand tool used for gripping and turning plumbing pipes to tighten or loosen them during installation or repair. As you might have guessed, description 2 matches the image E. I think description 3 matches putty knife. And the putty knife is a flat, flexible tool, often with a metal blade used for applying and smoothing substances like spuckle, correction putty or paint on surfaces. And description 3 matches choice C. I think choice 4 is a grease gun. A grease gun is a handheld device designed for applying a lubricating grease to machinery, gears or bearings to reduce friction or maintain proper functioning. And last but not least description find resembles a chainsaw. Chainsaw is a portable mechanical saw with a rotating chain of sharp teeth commonly used for felling trees, cutting branches and processing wood in forestry, construction or landscaping. You can see grease gun matching image A and chainsaw matching image D. Did you come up with any other conclusions? Or maybe have some other thoughts about this question? Please make sure to post your feedback and rationale in comments so we can all learn. This is one of the most exciting questions because it allows you to test your analytical skills and understanding of physics. You need to determine which fan throws more air if all the fans rotate at the same speed. The choices are fan A, fan B, fan C, and last but not least, choice D, neither fan. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the answer. Are you ready? I am moving forward to share with you my version of the answer. And if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. As you might be well aware, there are two key factors to help determine the airflow rate. The first one is the size of the fan's blade. And the second one is rotational speed of the fan, which is measured in RPMs, which stands for revolution per minute. A fan with the larger blades can capture and move more air per revolution compared to the same fan design with the smaller blades. And this is exactly what we're dealing with here in this question. In addition, the rotational speed of the fan affects the airflow design. The higher RPM generally results in the higher airflow rate as the fan blades are able to move through the air at the faster rate. As you can see here, the fans A, B and C all have the same design. This is why, given the fact that three fans have the same design but different sizes, the fan with the largest size will throw more air compared to the smaller fans. This is why the correct answer here is choice C. Did you get to the same answer? If not, please share your answer and rationale in comments. Here's an absolutely brilliant and at the same time very tricky question, but I have full confidence that you'll be able to solve it. You need to determine which item is the heaviest. And you're presented with four possible choices. Choice A, two pound of iron. Choice B, two pound of cotton. Choice C, two pound of potatoes. And last but not least, choice D, neither one. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the answer. I am pretty sure you already have an answer by now, so I'm moving forward to share with you my version of the solution. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. As you might have figured out, all three objects, two pound of iron, two pound of potatoes and two pound of cotton will have the same weight. The explanation for this is that the weight of an object is determined by the force of gravity acting in it and this force is proportional to the mass of the object. Since all three objects have a mass of two pounds, they will experience the same gravitational force and therefore will have the same weight. But the confusion here is that the density of these objects is different. Density is a measure of how much mass is packed into a given volume. Iron is much denser than potatoes or cotton. This is why, if you have to compare the volume occupied by each object, the iron will take up less space than the potatoes or the cotton. Presented images are very misleading and were designed to confuse you. So the correct answer here is choice D, neither object, since neither object is the heaviest. And now I have a question for you to practice your skills. We have a three different scenarios of person moving the object. Choices A, B and C. 
if all items weighed the same, which object would be easiest to move forward if the same person is pushing with equal force? You need to select one out of four possible choices. Choices A, B, C, or choice D, neither one. When you solve this challenge, please make sure to post your answer in comments so I can give you my feedback. Thanks for participating and good luck. I love this question because it really boosts your IQ and improves your intelligence. You're presented with three rows of objects. Each object represents a square and circle inside. You need to select the missing object out of four possible choices. Choices A, B, C, and D. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the solution. I have full confidence that you figured it out by now. And this is why I'm moving forward to share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. To better solve this challenge, let's assign columns and rows to each object here in the picture. We will have columns A, B, and C, and rows 1, 2, and 3. This would allow us to reference objects better. As you might have guessed, each row describes the pattern of ball bouncing against the wall. Let's start by looking at the object A1. This is where the ball in the upper left corner and it moves downwards toward the middle of the bottom section. And this is where exactly we see the ball in the object B1. After that, ball bounces and moves upward, and this is how we see it in C1. When ball bounces against the wall, it travels in the direction based on the angle of the initial impact. After the initial impact, the ball will continue moving in the new direction until acted upon by another force, such as hitting another wall or an object. Let's confirm this pattern by looking at the row 2. In the object A2, we see the ball against the left wall. Then it moves toward the bottom wall and then bounces against the bottom wall and then moves toward the right wall. Knowing the pattern, we can easily detect the answer now. If you look closely at the picture, the ball in the row 3 moves from the position 1 to the position 2 and then to the position 3. So the correct answer here is choice C. Did you get to the same answer? Or maybe you know the tips how to solve these problems better. Please make sure to post and share them in comments so we can all learn. Here's an amazing question to test your knowledge of mechanical movement of objects. You're presented with the picture of person moving the object. And you need to determine if all objects weigh the same, which one will be easiest to move forward if the same person is pushing with equal force. You need to select one out of four possible choices. Choice A, person moving forward a cube. Choice B, person moving forward a hexagon. Choice C, person moving forward a ball. And last but not least is neither one. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the answer. On my end, I'm moving forward to share with you my version of the solution. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. Let's analyze all shapes individually to better understand the answer. Let's start with the cube. Cube typically has a symmetrical weight distribution, which can contribute to its stability when moving on the ground. However, due to its edges and corners, a cube can experience higher levels of friction when compared to objects with rounded shapes and will be hard to roll. Most likely way of moving the cube forward would be pushing it, which will create a lot of resistance. Now let's look at the hexagon. Hexagon has six sides and the shape can vary depending upon the specific dimensions and proportions. Compared to a cube, a hexagon is generally has fewer edges and corners, which reduces the friction and makes it easier to move on the ground by rolling. Even though it might be easier to move than the cube, the ease of movement will also depend on the specific dimensions and weight distribution of the hexagon. Which brings us to choice C, sphere or ball, which typically has a smooth surface. The absence of edges and corners reduces the contact area with the ground, which results in a lower friction. This makes it easier to move the ball forward by rolling on the ground, compared to objects with edges or corners. This is why choice C is correct. It will have minimum friction and will facilitate smooth movement with minimum resistance. Here is the challenging problem by solving which you will boost your cognitive abilities. You're presented with five hints and using these hints you need to unlock the code and open the lock. The hints are in the digits 248, only one digit is correct and well placed.
In the digits 8, 4, 5, two digits are correct, but not correctly placed. In the digits 4, 6, 1, only one digit is correct, and it is correctly placed. In the digits 5, 9, 2, only one digit is correct, and it is well placed. And last but not least, hint that in the digits 904, none of the digits are correct. To open the lock, you need to process all the hints and select one out of four possible choices. Choice A, 518. Choice B, 485. Choice C, 418. And last but not least, choice D, 568. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the answer. I'm pretty sure you're done solving it by now, so I'm moving forward to share with you my version of the answer and solution. And if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. As you might have guessed, you solve this problem through elimination. And I'm going to start with the hint number 5, because it's the most helpful of all. Once we've learned that in combination 904 none of the digits are correct, we can eliminate two possible answers. We can eliminate both choices B and C because both of them have digit 4, which is an incorrect digit. Let's continue elimination to get to the correct answer. If we look through the remaining four hints, we learn that in hint 1, where digits are 2, 4, 8, only one digit is correctly placed, which is digit 8. In hint 2, two digits are correct, but they're not correctly placed, and they're digits 8 and 5. In hint 3, only one digit 6 is correct, and it is correctly placed. And last but not least, in hint 4, digit 5 is correct and it is well placed. Based on this, the correct answer here is choice D, 568. Do you have any hints to show how to best solve these types of challenges? If you do, please make sure to post them in comments. I love this question because it truly tests your knowledge of mechanical engineering. You are presented with acrobat and the weight on a seesaw. You need to determine in which direction should the acrobat move his body to balance the seesaw. And you only have two choices. Choice A to the left or choice B to the right. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the answer. On my end, I am moving forward to share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. As you might be well aware, the seesaw is an example of a lever where fulcrum is between the effort and the load. In our example, we have a weight on the left side of the seesaw and acrobat on the right side of the seesaw. The key principle of balancing the seesaw is when a force is applied to the end of the lever, the lever can lift the weight at the other end. For the seesaw to be balanced, the torque applied to the acrobat must increase. Since the acrobat's weight is constant, the only way to increase the input torque is by increasing the distance from the fulcrum. If acrobat moves in the direction B, this will shift the acrobat's center of gravity further from the fulcrum, resulting in a greater torque, thereby balancing it. So the correct answer here is choice B, moving the acrobat to the right. Here's an amazing problem where you need to exercise your brain and cognitive skills by calculating not just one number, but two numbers. You're presented with the scale, and you see that the value of diamond as well as the sum values are missing. And you need to ensure that scale remains balanced by calculating the value of the diamond as well as the sum. And once you've done with your calculations, you need to select out of four possible choices. Choice A, values 18 and 96. Choice B, values 12 and 88. Choice C, values 20 and 92. And last but not least, choice D, values 19 and 94. Take a close look, maybe pause this video to see if you can complete the calculations. On my end, I am moving forward to share with you my version of the calculations. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. To solve this challenge, let's look at the picture closely to better understand what we're dealing with. We're presented with the multi-tier scale. And the scale has four tiers, tier one, tier two, tier 3 and tier 4. Scale remains in balance because values on the left side and on the right side are equal and the values are represented by the total of numbers inside of each shape. For example, circle has number 12, hexagon has number 6, triangle has number 3 and square has number 4. Let's look closely at tier 3 to better understand how this tier remains in balance. As I already mentioned, each tier remains in balance because the numbers are equal on both sides. So on the left of the tier 3, 
we have two hexagons with total value of 12. On the right of the tier 3, we have hexagon, which equals number 6, plus two triangles, 3 plus 3. So on both sides, the total value is 12. This is why tier 3 remains in balance. Now let's look closely at the tier 2. On the left of the tier 2, we have two circles. Each circle has a value of 12. Two circles would be equal 24. On the left of the tier 2, we have two circles with total value of 24 and the entire tier 3, which also equals 24. This is what keeps tier 2 in balance. Now, knowing this logic, we can calculate the missing value on tier 4. Because tier 4 needs to remain in balance, the value of 12 plus 6 should be equal to the missing value, which means that the missing value is 18. And the total sum will be calculated as the sum of all the numbers. The sum of tier 2 and tier 3 would be 24 plus 24 plus 48 on the right side of tier 1, which would equal 96. So the correct answer here is choice A, 18 and 96. Did you get to the different answer? Please make sure to post your answer and solution in comments. Let's look at the question where you need to determine the trajectory after parachutists jump from the plane. Obviously, based on the wind and other external conditions, there would be multiple choices. But fortunately, you need to select only one out of four possible choices. Choices A, B, and C. And if none of the choices A, B, and C is correct, you need to select choice D, which would represent neither one. Take a close look to see what is the parachutist's trajectory after jumping from the plane. I have full confidence in your skills and knowledge, so I'm moving forward to share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. To better understand the answer, we need to determine what changes from when parachutist is inside the plane and when parachutist jumps from the plane. When parachutist is inside the plane, both the parachutist and the airplane are moving together in the same direction. When parachutist jumps from the plane, there are multiple forces that will determine the trajectory. Number one is inertia. According to Newton's first law of motion, the law of inertia, the parachutists will continue moving forward in the direction of the plane. Initially, the parachutist will have the velocity they had inside the plane, but they will slow down over time due to air resistance. Another force that will define the trajectory is the force of gravity. As soon as the parachutist leaves the plane, they will be subject to the force of gravity. Gravity pulls the parachutist downward toward the earth. And the last force that will drive the trajectory would be acceleration due to gravity. Acceleration due to gravity is the force that pulls objects toward the earth. When something is in the air, gravity causes it to fall toward the ground. The acceleration due to gravity is always the same for all objects near the Earth's surface, and it means that objects will fall faster and faster the longer they fall. So let's look closely at what's going to happen after parachutist jumps. After jumping, the parachutist initially maintains the horizontal velocity due to inertia. Once outside the airplane, they accelerate downward due to gravity until they reach terminal velocity. The deployment of the parachute increases air resistance, allowing for controlled descent, allowing parachutists to land safely. The closest answer that describes the solution is choice A. Is this what you got in your answer? If not, please make sure to post your solution and rationale in comments so we can all learn. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate you for helping us to become one of the largest YouTube channels to help people become smarter increase your IQ, and to pass any test. If the content of this video was helpful, please make sure to click the like button to help YouTube algorithm promote this video and help other people to find it faster. Giving us a like is also a way for you to tell us that you need more content like this, and when you tell us, we will deliver it for you in the future. For links to free and premium resources, please check the description and comments of this video. You can also go directly to our website, howtoanalyzedata.net, to download the materials related to this topic. I really appreciate your endorsement, support, and patronage of this channel. And thank you for considering to become a member and considering to subscribe. Please leave feedback, suggestions, or corrections in comments. And all the best on your journey. I'll see you in my next video.